Good morning. My name is Lars Boering. I'm the managing director of World Press Photo, and uh, it's an honor for me to be here at the conference and uh, to be moderating uh, today's talk discussion. Uh, not just uh, a talk, because I feel uh, it's very important that we engage you as well in this uh, conversation. So I'd like you to ask uh, many questions. Uh, you have make sure that there's enough time and uh, possibilities to do this. So please feel free to do so. Um, today we have uh, our guest in, uh, in this uh, conversation uh, from uh, left to right, uh, Laura Bushnak, uh, Swan T, Howie Young, Nana Kofi Aqua, and Kemal Jufri. And I will uh, ask them to introduce themselves uh, in a minute. The uh, panel today is uh, very much about visual journalism. I see that there's a lot of uh, conversations about journalism in general, but uh, with the strength and the power of visual storytelling and the importance of visuals in, uh, in media, maybe even more than ever before, uh, I think it's also valuable and very important that we talk about journalism also as visual journalism and all the combinations. The uh, ubiquity of images has become the staple of the digital age. The overload of photographs and videos on social media is but one example of how visual storytelling has become central to societies today. Enabled by information technology and digital platforms, this abundance of images has deeply affected the ways in which injustices are exposed and made public. While photojournalism and documentary photography have a long history of depicting social grievances, citizen journalism has enabled the public to stay informed about acts of injustice everywhere and instantaneously. Mobile phone cameras have equipped citizens with the capacity to capture and quickly disseminate images of injustice that can poten potentially stir up the public opinion. From footage of police misconduct to scenes of migrants and refugees fleeing their home countries. Now, without proper contextualization, video and pictures depicting violences and injustices can easily be misconstrued and used to undermine rights to equality, privacy, and dignity. In addition, sharing via social media and other outlets often lacks thorough analysis and alternative perspectives. The interpretation of injustices frequently occurs on an emotional and an immoral level, neglecting the value of critical thinking and media and information literacy. In this news ecosystem, important questions arise about the fast dissemination of images, their value, and their capacity to create more just societies. Furthermore, with the rise of so-called fake news, perhaps better described as faked news, visual content, content used out of context has become a primary source of truth, highlighting the importance thereby of professional and credible journalism. I would like to start with a short introduction. I would start with you, Laura. Um, please use the microphone uh, to introduce yourself shortly to the audience. And so we go around the table before we start the conversation. So my name is Laura Bushnak. I'm a Palestinian photographer. I was born and raised in Kuwait. Um, my work is focused on the Arab world dealing with issues such as gender, women's rights, uh, education, and the aftermath of, uh, of war. Yes, please. Um, I'm Ang Swanti. I'm a photographer based in Jakarta. Apart from that, I'm also a program manager at Panya Photo Institute, a foundation that focuses on photo education. Hi, my name is Hao Hui Yang. I'm a photographer based in Beijing for the European Press Photo Agency. Um, I'm a Singaporean, and basically we cover um, China, mainland China, and we also do Hong Kong and Mongolia, and recently uh, also covered North Korea as well. Hi, my name is Nana Kofi Akwa. I'm from Ghana. Uh, my name is Nana Kofi Akwa. I'm from Ghana. I'm a freelance photographer and uh, a member of uh, Everyday Africa on Instagram. Uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Kemal Jufri. I'm a photographer, freelance photographer from here, Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, I cover uh, mostly social uh, and environmental issues, uh, mostly in Indonesia and some part of Asia. Um, and I've uh, I've been uh, a photojournalist for about 20, 20, 20 years, uh, 22 years. Kemal, if I can start with you, um, being a photographer in Indonesia, um, covering not just Indonesia, I think, but the, the, the whole region. Um, what can you say about uh, the, the dominant visual representation of Southeast Asia? Um, what we see is that uh, most of the time it has been uh, shot by different photographers from all over the world, but in the, in, let's say in the, in, the, in the past, a lot of Western photographers uh, showed it. What's the difference now uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I think that um, it, there, there will always be a difference between how the Western uh, uh, journalists parachuting coming to a country that they don't know much uh, about the cultural, you know, and, and, and also there's always the language barrier and also a point of view uh, because of limited uh, information that they have uh, before they come to countries in, in, in Southeast Asia. And of, uh, I think that local photographers uh, will always have an edge to that because they have um, better understanding of the, of the culture and also uh, a, a different point of view um, to be able to tell a more nuanced uh, uh, story uh, of the story, more, more nuanced to the story compared to uh, what a, a Western journalist would, would be able to do. Even, even though some, some of them do a good job, you know, and um, uh, are able to, to to, to do a good job, but... Uh, can, can you say that they have a... Is there a different visual approach? I, th I think uh, in terms of visual approach, uh, it's, it's getting to be more and more similar because uh, even the local photographers now uh, have the same standard uh, uh, in terms of uh, portraying. Uh, but I think... Um, local photographers will be m much more s sensitive in, in trying to uh, portray certain things that uh, compared to, to their Western counterpart uh, because of the cultural uh, difference. Do, do you also feel that, uh, let's say, the, the, the audience, the, the, I, I just read this morning that there's 150 million Indonesian on, let's say, Facebook. Can you also say that this will, the way they portray their own society and their own life, does that influence you as a photographer, as a journalist? Oh, you mean the... Yeah, the, 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 the images that you get from the audience, from people just sh using their phones, does right. that involve, does that change your way of, of uh, working as a journalist? Um. Not really, but I, I think it makes me uh, understand more. That uh, it, it makes me realize more that uh, photo. I mean, photojournalism is more about the uh, content. You know, it's not really about the aesthetic. And um, anybody can do that now with a with a phone camera, and and still uh, people. You know, that's that's the first that's the first place people get the you know the, the their information. Because uh, you know, someone will always be there to witness uh, this thing happening and, and recording it there. That will be their first. But of course, uh, relying on uh, on uh, uh, citizen journalism uh, means that sometimes you know this this uh, uh, the stuff that that comes out in the in the in the social media are not filtered, mm. and therefore uh, that's where. Us professionals have uh, a, a better an edge, you know, in terms of how to. Uh, it's not censorship, but but we become more. We, we are more sensitive to the to the ethics 
uh, as to what we deliver uh, even online. You know? Because that's where you, as a journalist, start your research and to ch check on, on facts. Yes, yes, yeah. and we go deeper, and, and that's why I think the role of profession, professional photojournalists is uh, more uh, to, to, go, to go more in-depth, you know, to, 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 to dig the story deeper and instead of just in the surface. And I don't see this uh, citizen, citizen journalism uh, as, as a threat to the profession. In fact, it's, it's in fact uh, uh, something that go hand in hand, something that is uh, add value to. I mean, it's, it's, it's like substituting, substituting what, what, what we are missing because we cannot be everywhere. So that's the first point of info that uh, people will see and then they want to know more about the story. They want to go uh, and, and find more nuance to the story and that's where our role mm -hmm. comes in. Swanti, um, I have a question for you. Do you are involved in education. Uh, how does education has changed if you listen to uh, Kemal talking about journalism and principles and you're involved in education and uh, on the other hand technology, things are changing so much. How do you, let's say, educate photographers to handle this? Okay, thank you Lars for the question. I think um, I would, for me, I would like to see the other way around from the phenomenon that Western or international photographers came to Indonesia and make reportage. On the other hand, that's also make us Indonesian photographers now are allowed to take report or to go abroad and make a coverage. Mm -hmm. Like for education, I joined this business in nine, around 20 after the reform era, of course, like, like more junior than Kemal. But now I have seen that younger colleagues who make a reportage overseas. So instead of having Western or international coming down to Indonesia, we also have Indonesian photographers who make reportage overseas. Of course, the problem is always the same. Um, the question is how sensitive we are as a foreign photographer in a one country. We have gentlemen over there who often make reportage in Afghanistan, Australia. So I think it's it's not the issue about having the foreigners in our country, but it's more how to have individual as a professional. Mm. I think being sensitive can be taught through the education. In Panya Photo Institute, we also teach um, how to strengthen visual aspect, but also ethical and code of conduct as a photojournalist. Now we focus on critical thinking to raise awareness on social uh, phenomena and what's really happening because I also see that we still lack of in-depth reportage on social issue here in Indonesia. And I think that's, that's the biggest part of education that can take a role. Mm. And address to the issue that we are uh, part of the bigger internet user in the world as a photographer is doesn't bother me that people can upload photograph instantly and the new phenomenon right now. But as an educator, I concern on how we can maintain the credible and ethical journalism and that report us. Mm. Um, yeah. do, do you feel that education of journalism is very much focused on, let's say, the journalistic rules. Now you tell that ethics is b becoming an important uh, role. Um, but the audience that is shooting work themselves uh, don't have, don't apply always these, these rules. How do you feel that um, journalists, visual journalists also play a role in, in, in showing everyday topics that are not necessarily about uh, negative things, but also about positive things. Okay, if we talk about professional photojournalist or practitioner, I think they, they have to think over what they are going to publish. They put a caption, proper caption, they think of the context of the photographs before they uploading the pictures. When we come to the what so-called citizen journalism or even public in general that become the issue. Like I'm referring to the, to the situation, current situation in Jakarta 
when the investigator of anti-corruption body in Indonesia got an attack acid on his face and someone took a photograph of his burning face on the hospital and instantly uploading it on his social media. That's the first pictures that I saw on Facebook mm. uh, prior to the main mainstream online media. And of course that's creating the debate or arguing about the ethic which is correct to upload that kind of pictures because it's ignoring the family's feeling, how it feels. On the other hand, it might create a sympathy to, to what's, what's happening. But I'm like looking at the ethic in the past, I would agree that might not correct to upload that kind of such a direct uh, photograph on Facebook. But then later on, I also look at the pictures on online media that use more or less a similar. Then I start to wonder, how would we do as a professional, as an educator? Mm -hmm. Should we define or redefine what the term of journalism these days in accordance to the what's happening right now? Or the ethic or the rules? Mm -hmm. So it's not really clear black and white, right or wrong. Maybe it's opening a dialogue and find a solution is more the important to do these days. Yeah, because uh, if you talk about freedom, uh, press freedom, that clearly focused on making sure that everything is being seen or being heard. Uh, can uh, can the, the citizen journalism in that sense also help to get topics uh, to the surface and, and uh, get journalists to respond to that? Oh. Do, do also citizen journalism, does it also help? Well, uh, I think it's what's happening in, uh, in, in the world is first it's responsive by the community itself. They, they are very close, like Kemal said, they are there. So it's, the access is nearer than a professional photojournalist. Of course, on the one hand, it helps in terms of bringing the issue on the surface. But it's also, what I've observed is often lead to a pointless discussion and arguing and forget the substantial issue itself. Of course, then the, pro the professional photojournalist will know what's happening and then make an in-depth or more professional and credible, credible uh, reporters. But I think it's more important than to think of the next step was actually what we can do to call a concrete action after the all debate and pointless arguing on social media. Mm. Laura, um, you are also very involved in education, um, playing an active role. What do you feel that is important for visual literacy? If we talk about the world becoming more visual, then we have professional photographers, we have an audience that is also engaging. How important is the visual literacy for everybody to, to really understand what images do? I mean, definitely we're being bombarded by daily images on social media, and that's where our responsibility as professionals lie, that we need to not just provide the image, but we need to also provide the correct information that goes with the image that would end up educating and giving knowledge to the audience. Um, and that's our responsibility. So when the way I approach my personal work, uh, because I come from a troubled region, um, where it's being overcovered by the media and there's a lot of misconception about, especially when it comes to Arab women, for example. Um, so my work, I divide my work into two parts. At the beginning, when I approach the subject, depending where I'm shooting, because let's say if I'm working in Gaza, it's different than working in Saudi Arabia. So when, I, I'm, when I'm approaching my subjects, first I have to gain their trust to allow me to take their pictures, and then second, allow me to publish those pictures. So I always share the images and the text that would go with the images before publishing to get their approval. And then the second, pa the second part of my work is when I pitch the story to the magazines, where I get involved with the editor when we edit the text to pay attention to the vocabulary being used and how they want to portray 
this subject. And here my worry is not really about me getting in trouble with the authorities, but it's more being worried about the subjects who trusted me and allow me to publish their work. So recently, a few days ago, a magazine published my work uh, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have edited the text together. We change a lot of the terminology being used, and we agree because it was, you know, cooperation, teamwork. But I missed one thing, the headline. So the piece went online, and the headline read, uh, Women fight, Fighting Patriarchy. When I shared it with the women, uh, they all disagreed with the title. They didn't want to be associated with patriarchy. They said, this is not what we do. We don't fight patriarchy. Uh, two of them are public figures and said, we're going to release a statement on social media to, you know, disagreeing with the uh, uh, headline. And I told them, just wait a second, let's check with the editor and ask them to change the title. And luckily they did yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so th the responsibility lies on professional photographers to, and this is, I'm going to add to my colleague that, that you have foreign versus local. Um, we need to be very sensitive when we're approaching the subjects we're dealing with, because uh, really it can put the lives of the people we're working with at risk. And that's where we have to be very sensitive, um, get, do more research before visiting a country, and above all, rely on local fixers and trust them because they definitely know more than us. Even if you come from the same country, there are still many things that you don't know about and that you need to learn about. So um, the lit image literacy, definitely, it's important. And this is our job, is to do it in the correct way. Mm. Is, it, is it hard? Because this is what you just described, is a, let's say, a long, sometimes slow process to get it right, to get it precise. On the other hand, you have an audience that is completely open and out there, can do it instantly. Is that a disadvantage for you? That I mean, that's, or do you feel that it's the, the job of a, a journalist to go more into depth? Absolutely, I don't know, I don't feel it, because yes, you, you see many information out there in the media, and this is our job. We need to take it one step further, go more into depth with it. The National Geographic magazine found out that their Instagram feed was successful is because they provide a lot of information with the image. When they post an image, there is a long caption. And they found out that people actually do read the caption and they do interact with it. So posting a beautiful image on social media, yes, it's fine, it's, it's good, you like it, but it's not enough. Uh, you need to get a more engaged audience that they would, uh, not just you know be moved by the image, but react to it. Mm. And I think that's where providing the correct and interesting information comes. Yeah. And it's, that's our job as professionals. Do you feel free enough as a professional to tell the stories that you feel are important? No, not always. I mean, coming from the region, uh, unfortunately, we have to do self-censorship. Um, and we have to be careful on the way we do it, not to end up serving certain propaganda, because at the same time, I still want to pass uh, a certain message. Our work is political, we cannot avoid it. So we try, me and my colleagues try our best to pass the message we want to, you know, talk about in an indirect way, let's say. So, and that's why with my work, I try to focus on more positive stories, so you, and, and this is how you start asking questions of the problems behind uh, these stories. So this is how the woman is working against, let's say, um, illiteracy in a certain country. And then that's, you start questioning, so what's happening, what's the story behind it. We have to be careful how we address certain taboos. We need to, um, in like, for example, in Gaza, uh, the women were politically outspoken. They didn't care about what I would uh, use in the text because um, th th this it's it's easier. While in Saudi Arabia, I had to be, you know, uh, very careful with what I talk about and how I address certain issues. Yeah, Nana, um, you are a photographer yourself, but you're also involved with Everyday Africa, which is and online on uh, Instagram, the different voice or the own voice of Africa. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about how important it is to have this different voice of the audience out there to, to portray uh, a different visual voice? Uh, thank you, thank you, Lars. Uh, I think, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say that I am personally not against um, the foreigner coming to photograph on my home turf. Uh, I personally feel that when you're too familiar with something, you, it blinds you. And sometimes you need the foreigner to help you relook at your environment. This is, this is very natural, you know. When, uh, when something is too familiar, you, it, you start taking it for granted. So uh, I think the main challenge uh, that Africa has had with uh, mainly Western photographers over the centuries is that most of them come with the assumption that they are the professionals, they know, they are the experts. You know, uh, We have people who spend a year or two in Africa and call themselves experts on the region, give themselves fancy titles, and, uh, and have this air of superiority. What that does is that because of that presumption, they blind themselves to, to what Africa has to offer. They come with a script and they look for the elements that will fit that script. You know, so they overlook everything else. They overlook the obvious and will go and find that malnourished child or that child soldier or, or that. Uh, but if you would come and you'd come with honest curiosity, if you'd come with respect, Africa really has a lot to teach you. Uh, I am African, but to assume that because I'm African, I fully understand Africa is, is myopic, is a joke. Why? Because I speak about three or four African languages. But if I walk just a few minutes from my house, I get into a community whose local language I don't understand. This is just a few minutes from my house. I don't understand the language they speak. Uh, to not understand a language also means that you don't understand their belief systems. You don't understand what makes them tick. You don't understand why they do what they do. Because a culture, a language pretty much sums up what a whole culture is. And as long as you don't understand a language, you definitely don't understand the culture. And in my own country, uh, Ghana has over 60 languages, and I speak only four. So I can't even claim to be an expert on Ghana. And even in the places where I speak the language, there is still so much more. Because historically, how we communicate is very different. Uh, we communicate with a lot of symbolism and a lot of proverbs. Uh, and if you're Western educated, you work in an environment where there is a lot of messages, but you miss out on all of them because that is, you are illiterate in, in the traditional language of the people. Uh, so when I find myself in the, all these other places that are supposed to be home to me, but I'm quite unfamiliar with, the first thing I do is that I ask. And I stay curious and extremely respectful. I think that sometimes just respecting what you see and not thinking yourself uh, as judge or uh, thinking you know better opens up opportunities for learning. You know, so I will encourage as many people who want to photograph Africa as possible to come. But don't come thinking you know. Because, for example, I, I just, just before this session, I was having a conversation with, with Laura where I told her that I grew up for a long time as an only child. But I was never lonely because I grew up in a community where I lived in the same house with older cousins and younger uncles and aunties. So it's a cycle, it's a, a village raising a child. So whereas in other parts of the world, being an only child comes with being lonely and 
your parents go to work and you're stranded. I never experienced that. And so, even though there are high levels of poverty in, in, in Africa, suicide is something very rare. Mm. You know, because everybody knows, ev literally, literally, everybody knows everybody. When will Europe catch up to that level of social development? You know, when will it be okay to just bump into a neighbor and ask them how are you and actually stop and hear their response? You know, so you realize that maybe infrastructure-wise, uh, technology-wise, there's a lot of development. But if you really want to live fully as a human being, as somebody who is part of a bigger world, call it Ubuntu, Africa has a lot to teach you. you know, and, and that's why I like the idea of everyday Africa. Everyday Africa was born out of two American, uh, uh, Americans in Africa, sent on assignment in Africa. Fortunately, both of them had lived in Africa. Peter had lived in Ghana, and Austin had lived in, in Cote d'Ivoire. And after the Cote d'Ivoire Civil War, they were sent by some editor in, in New York to go and capture the remnants of the war or whatever some grim story. And the guys are there and they are frustrated because they know the kind of images the editor is expecting and yet the reality they are seeing is very different. So they started taking photos with their phones of the everyday, the regular, and started sharing those on Instagram. And that is how Everyday Africa started. You know. And it really has had a huge impact because it changed for lots of people. It opened a lot of eyes. Do you agree with that? No, I do, I do. And I think that what is interesting is that a, a lot of the time, so you think, oh, it's opening the eyes of the people out there. But actually, also for a lot of Africans. Uh, there are a lot of Africans in, in Europe, you know, in America, grew up there, sometimes born there, but of African parents, who had been ashamed of their African identity because the dominant imagery they had been used to had been one that said that African is inferior, or he's violent, or is a, you know, it's, it's been negative after negative after negative imagery. I'm sure there are people in here who are surprised that I speak English, and, and so well, because for if everything they know about Africa is, and if I tell them I've never schooled in Europe or America, that I literally schooled in Ghana from nursery to university, they'll be shocked. How come you speak English and, and speak it well? Mm. And, and I say, most people speak like me, where, where I'm from. You know. Is this, is this a, a, um, a clear example where, let's say, these are not, I mean, it's not citizen journalists, it's just based people telling about their everyday life, where it has changed this perception of journalism as the storyteller, finding stories, but maybe this underlines that maybe the audience has m many more stories to tell than just the stories that journalists are looking for. I think that we have to look at the history of journalism in Africa to, to fully understand the situation. So basically, Africa has had two types of journalists coming. Uh, you have the ones who are interested in the lions and the zebras and the giraffes, you know, the whole Nagio kind of journalists. Uh, so they go to the Sahel. So at the airport, somebody was telling me, you have a lot of sand in Africa. And I said, what do you mean you have a lot of sand in Africa? I said, oh, when I think of Africa, I, I see all these mountains of sand. And I said, oh, that's just the Sahel. There is more than that to Africa. So you have that. And then you have the ones who are part of the whole colonialism uh, uh, machinery, you know, where to colonize Africa, first, you have, you have to believe that you are better than the African. And then, too, you have to get the African to believe that you are better than him. You know, so to, to, to get that point across, you have to make the African believe that everything he is or she is or believes in or has is inferior, you know, and then everything you have is superior. Now, the challenge is that over many generations, a lot of young Africans have believed this lie. And so, what everyday Africa, which appears to be something, you know, it doesn't appear to be a big deal. What it's doing is not only is it informing the young people or people from the other side who, who actually believe they are superior, 
that no, you are not. But it's also informing young Africans that you are not inferior. You know, that this whole thing was part of colonialism. And if you've been, if, I mean, I'm, sure, I'm sure people from Indonesia are familiar with colonialism. You know, it's, 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 a, system, it's a system that first has to dehumanize you so that it can control you. Uh, and uh, the, the remnants of it are, are still most cultures, things most cultures all over the world grapple with. You know, and, but how do you change that? You change that by taking ownership of your own story. How do you take ownership of your own story? You have to start asking very simple questions. What is beautiful, for example? Uh, as an African, do I have to stretch my hair, put chemicals in it, or buy wigs from Asia or somewhere and have long flowing hair? Is, is, is a long flowing hair that is beautiful or is what the French call chevaux crepou. Is it okay? Is it okay to just have my fro? And, and so you come to my house and nobody has a perm. My wife has a huge fro, my daughter has a huge fro. You know, that is beautiful. It's little things like that. Is it okay to have thick black lips? Of course. Is it okay to have dark skin? Yes, it's beautiful. Uh, why do they turn all the time if being black is so bad? You, know, you have to really go back to fundamentals and start appreciating who you are and what you are, and then project that uh, through, through the channels. Fortunately, what social media has done is that I don't have to send my story to some photo editor somewhere uh, to decide whether they'll publish it or not. I have almost 100,000 followers on Instagram. Whatever I want to say, I say it. The world hears it. Uh, Everyday Africa has over 300,000 followers. Recently, with Bill Gates uh, wrote that he follows us. So yeah, I can speak to Bill Gates. You know, I can, <laughs> through a post on Instagram. The world has changed. Yeah. Um, Young, you, this is a clear example of the, let's say the audience, people living in a place, telling their own stories in a very different way. This is uh, very much different than the photography that you are involved with because you are working with photographers as journalists and you need to verify photos. And Can you tell a little bit about how that works? How do you uh, uh, make sure that the photos that uh, EPA is sending out are, let's say, to be trusted? Um, yes, uh, basically EPA works as a wire photo agency and we uh, adhere to the rules and code of conduct of um, the National Press Phot Photographers Association, NPPA. And one of these, um, uh, one of these uh, code of conducts, the top four basically, are uh, to be accurate and comprehensive in the representation of our subjects disease um, being man manipulated by stage photo opportunities, uh, be complete and provide context when photographing or recording subjects, avoid stereotyping individuals and groups, recognize and work to avoid presenting one's own biases in the work, and of course, the most important, treat all subjects with respect and dignity. I mean, the list goes on and on. So these are some of the, the code and conducts that of, um, of our profession that we um, communicate to the photographers uh, working for our agency. I, I can't really say much about other wire agencies, but this is what um, EPA would uh, expect their photographers to, to have, and that we would um, work as much as possible to provide a more, uh, uh, to provide an accurate uh, captions and context to our photographs. But you can say that uh, that, that are very clear rules mm -hmm. and uh, very much journalistic driven. But how can you compete with an audience that does not have to live by these rules and can send out all the information they want? Is, is that something that you experience? Sometimes you cover a topic with photographers or journalists and then you find out there's m many different angles towards that story as well because lots of people are also there shooting the work by themselves with their phone. Um, that is true because, I mean, nowadays in this environment, everyone has a phone and everyone has a camera in that sense because, and then everyone is a photographer. 
And of course, everyone has their own point of view and they can post it on social media as well and they can say um, what is their uh, experience of that event. And, but, but of course, um, as those would, you would probably say this uh, citizen journalism, if you can call that, and they come with their own uh, experience of what, of their, and of their own uh, objectives and biases and what they want to communicate. But for us, as a professional photojournalist, um, we try to provide a more objective uh, view as much as possible and just uh, provide the context in which uh, this, the, the news uh, is, is being reported on. And that is, I mean, we can't compete with what these other people say because we can't go around saying that what they're saying is wrong or not. We can only say what we have uh, reported is uh, accurate to the best that we can verify. Mm -hmm. Does the audience, does social media sometimes also help with verification that you can find different angles and verify a story that is, is out there? Does it, do you also use social media and other images to, to, to make sure that the photos that you are sending out through a EPA as a journalist uh, are correct? I would say um, we also use social media to look at all the uh, photos that are out there as well. Um, in most instances, what we see, what we see uh, according to any differences from the citizen journalism, uh, we do not see that much of a difference if what we're reporting is more or less the same. Uh, in, in most instances, what we use citizen journalism in cases where we are not able to be there and we are not able to be cover the subjects uh, themselves. So in that sense, we also look at um, these uh, photos from uh, from social media to, to report on our stories. So um, I think it works both ways. We, we don't, uh, it, we kind of complement each other, uh, citizen journalism as well, but of course we have to be very careful and because some images uh, of course are fake and some images that cannot be verified and we can only take them as, um, as a reference. Uh, we cannot, and, and if we, want to use any of these images or we want to um, take them as a point of reference, then we try as much as possible to go to the source um, and to get a verification, to get um, the, the, the owner's, uh, I mean, uh, permission mm -hmm. to, to use them, which very often or not, we really can't because these images are shared and reshared and reshared in all this, in, um, in social media and especially in China, um, on WeChat and Weibo, you can't really actually get a, a, a handle on who, where the actual source is from. Yeah. Can, can you, are there examples where uh, EPA is sending out a story that is being used and social media is used to argue against it, to give a different point of view or even try to get the story sort of disputed? Is that something also that you're up against? Or is social media sometimes working against uh, journalism? Um, no, I don't really have an example for EPA specifically um, about uh, social media uh, disputing any photos, but I would say one of the most uh, more um, fam famous example is um, what Trump has said with his inauguration photos, uh, where he said, I mean, yes, you know, the crowds and crowds of people were there, but actually we use photos um, to verify that, you know, that actually there isn't really that many people there. Yeah. I'm gonna move this microphone to you, Kamal. If I, is that social media in Indonesia, we just uh, talked about many people being on it and using it uh, on a daily basis. Facebook just announced that they have two billion active users. Um, how do you see it? Do you use as a photojournalist social media a lot or do you still work mainly through the let's say, more traditional channels? Yeah, I happen to be a passive social media user. Um, I should be using it more, um, but um, I think the, the, the I mean, there, there's like a, there's advantages and disadvantages of distributing images uh, through social media, because I mean, um, the advantages is that some certain issues, uh, what, you know, with the with the image being viral, uh, it's 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 like a 
if you have a powerful image and then uh, you, com you, you distribute that through social media and the power of social media is the, the viral uh, effect uh, can actually um, uh, magnify the, 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 the effect that, that, that you want you know, in terms of change, positive change. And it has, um, it has, uh, it has done so in, uh, in, in many circumstances where uh, distributing the pictures through social media actually achieved that goal. But also there's uh, the negative side of, 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 of doing that is that, um, you know, sometimes images are used out of context by, by, by uh, by people, uh, and also the fact that um, you know, uh, it, it once it's used out of context, you know, uh, it, it can actually have a negative impact, and uh, it can lead to conflict. It can lead to a misunderstanding, and it can also lead to a lot of ethical problems uh, that uh, would not have. Uh, happen as, as severe as if you do it to the traditional channel. Yeah. So in, on the one side, it's, it's, it's sort of liberating. It's opening up a lot of opportunities and possibilities to, to share yes. certain stories. The other yes. hand, you feel that because it's hard to trust everything, it's always, the question mark is always there. Can we really trust it? Yeah, and um, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I still think that, um, you know, I personally um, think that it's good to, to distribute images also through social media because then we, we get to, to go directly to the audience. Uh, but as, as, as a reader, you know, uh, of social media, um, I, I now have this problem of uh, trust also, even with images or video that's edited out of context, uh, whether this is real or not, you know, there's a lot of manipulation uh, that cannot be verified if you just see that in social media. And um, I personally still would look for my information from trusted sources, um, media that I know have a good track record of uh, independence and integrity. And uh, that way I know for sure, I mean, it's never for sure, but I mean, I know that at least, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's this professional and ethical uh, guidelines that they have to follow instead of just like getting it from the social media. You don't use it, uh, you're, you're, you just said I'm not a very active user in it. Uh, yeah, I have an Instagram, but uh, there's, there's no pictures in it. Yeah. <laughs> and I... <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you I, do I with it? You just, you look at a lot of pictures. Uh, not, not, not really. I mean, uh, I, I mean, you know, a lot of people are using it now, and I'm, and I, I'm beginning to see uh, the advantages of, of, of you. But I think it's just a matter of habit. Because I, you know, I'm just not really spending a lot of time uh, uh, online. You know, even even on Facebook, you know, I I, I rarely uh, I rarely use it. I mean, I, you know, I, I I sometimes even wonder, you know, like how some people uh, uh, can do that. You know, because maybe they're good at multitasking. You know, it's like because I, you know, I I, I just I just uh, it's I think it's it's more of a habit uh, yeah. thing, but. I, I do realize the, the, the advantages of, of doing it and I and, 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 and I'm you know I'm I'm planning to start getting more active in it. Swanti, is this something if you talk to young students, um, do they use social media way more than let's say the the photographers that are longer in the field? Um, for me, myself, I'm more like Kemal. I'm a passive internet or social media user as a, as a personal experience. But as a program manager in Panya, I don't have no choice but following the social media, you know. Like, because it's easily to publish the, the event, for instance, or the concern or something through social media because 
our students or our community or those who associated mentors are on Facebook or now Twitter, Instagram or something. But for me, I'm more skeptic about the positiveness of using social media, particularly the recent time in Indonesia, which images on social media more create a pointless debate and arguing and often create a religion and ethnic sentiment which which might not happen without social media. On the other hand, I realized that uh, social media bring the good things, like bringing the audience of viewers closer to the photojournalists. They can get interactive or protest immediately. But then what's next after all the debates online or tomorrow? So what? But isn't it uh, maybe the task of journalism to follow up on these debates and use it also? Or are, are we as journalists too slow into adapting to this? Um, ideally, yes. Uh, that's part of our job as a professional, as an educator, also to balance what's going on on social media. When all those people like upload without contextualize the images, maybe a professional photojournalist and media sectors can take an important role and also education sectors. Mm. Um, in that case, I would say the, the importance of social media, but so far there's, there's no evidence or proof that convinced me on that case. You know, It's mm. more religion and sentiment uh, debate on, mm. on on social media. I'm talking like in the context of Indonesia. Yeah. If there's any questions now from the audience, do you feel free, there's a microphone, uh, please uh, do so. Um, if not, I, I, I will continue. Nana, um, talking about the same question to you about are, are we too slow uh, in as journalists to follow up on social media or I mean before we uh, we had a conversation to prepare for this talk and you used the example of uh, Arab Spring which has been sort of widely applauded for with social media being uh, the big force behind it uh, but you can also see there's some things against that uh, the platforms being used or misused yes uh, I think that uh, traditional and I'm uh, just just to, to clarify, I'm actually a journalist. I can show you my press card. So I have, <laughs> I'm, uh, and, and Everyday Africa, I, I mentioned Everyday Africa earlier. Everyday Africa has 30 contributors who are all professional journalists. You know, but there is what your editor will pu publish and there is what you think is the story. And what Everyday Africa does is it gives journalists the opportunity to share the stories that uh, you know, the, the gatekeeper might block. Uh, so it's a very professional platform in that sense. Uh, I think that professional journalists have to be careful of dinosaurism. You know, uh, if you refuse to evolve, uh, you, you will disappear. Uh, and, 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 and I say this jokingly, but also very seriously. Uh, and the reason why is, is because Social media is here to stay. How people uh, ingest news, how people take news, receive news, has changed, whether you like it or not. You know, uh, the, we don't use cassettes anymore. Uh, you can hold on to yours if you like. You can hold on to your, you know, <laughs> your DVD uh, players if you want. But the world has changed, and when you are in a race where everybody's moving so fast, running slow is already a problem, but stopping is, is far worse <laughs> than the person who, who reverses. And I see a lot of um, traditional journalists, I mean, because you know they've invested in education, they've, they've bought fancy equipment, received fancy training, uh, used to a certain kind of respect, and, and so are, are stuck in their role. And, and that is extremely dangerous. Let me ask you, where was social media during the First World War? 
or the Second World War or all the civil rights movements and, and wars in human history. And so to think that social media is the platform for chaos and it is where uh, turbulence comes from in, in society is actually not to appreciate the history uh, of, of, of humanity. You know, uh, people have always found ways to misbehave if, if it's misbehaving they want to do. What social media does is that it gives you a lot of power. You decide, do I want to use the power for good? I have 90 something thousand followers on Instagram. Do I want to use the platform to educate, to enlighten, to, to, to bless them? Or do I want to stir up animosity and anger towards others? I would rather have the power, I like cars, and what I always say when I'm looking at a car is I'd rather have the power and not use it than need it and not have it. You know, I would rather have a good social media platform and access and understanding of how it works and not use it than need to have some urgent message out there, need to help be a real change. I mean, for example, this year I've been working on hypertension. We call it a silent killer. Kills many people, you know, and most of the most vulnerable people have no idea that they are hypertensive, and then one day they are dead. I'd rather have a platform where between Everyday Africa and, and my own page, I can reach 400,000 people, some of them who would retweet or whatever and, and reach more people. So, so the power is there and we have to use it. Let me also say that I understand the fear of being a traditional journalist, because if you are a proper journalist, you understand the power of imagery. You see, uh, there's an old English poet called John Keats, and he wrote a poem called Ode to, Ode, to, Ode to a Gracian Urn, where he describes this painting on an urn, where there's this beautiful girl who is smiling. And he says, you know, you are always smiling. You don't change. You are so permanent. Your, your joy is permanent. And photographs are like that. Everybody does stupid things sometimes, and we all do great things sometimes. Now, the, 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 the power of a photograph is such that if I catch you in the moment of your weakness, of your, of your flaw, and I photograph it, that is imprinted on the mind of history. So the little girl in the fire crying is a grown woman lives her life, but in our minds, she's still that little girl caught in the fire, crying. The child with a vulture by it is that child, malnourished child. And a, a lot of Africa is still seen as that malnourished child with a vulture waiting for, for it to die. You know? and, and that's because of that permanent nature of imagery. The, the, the photographer or the photojournalist needs to be careful. Mm. You know, a, a lot of the fear we have as traditional journalists stems from the fact that we understand, even when we don't abide by it, we understand that after we've made a story, the story follows us. You know, a story casts a long shadow. And so uh, when people use social media recklessly, we know the danger it poses. But that is the more reason why we have to take over social media, take ownership, and direct it in the way we want it to go. We can't leave it in the hands of amateurs. Mm. That, that's too much power for amateurs to handle. Yeah. Laura, um, a question I asked about uh, the use of social media in the, in the Arab Spring. Can you consider that as, a, as an example where things helped, but also things might have worked against it through social media? Or well, how does it influence uh, the journalistic storytelling about it? What, no, I see that the social media in the Arab world definitely played a very positive role uh, at the beginning of the Arab Spring in Egypt. In, uh, specifically, there was a call on Facebook for the protest by three young guys from Cairo. And the, the guy who initiated a group calling for these protests was based in Dubai. And they were not expecting the huge reaction that happened with the, with the protesters. So definitely social media in a region where people are not free to voice their opinion, it was an alternative platform where a lot of people shifted to 
get information, uh, follow independent uh, journalists or activists, basically. Um, I use social media a lot for my work. I find it um, very important to, um, to, to share stories. And uh, as a, you know, being a, a photojournalist, naturally I follow a lot of uh, journalists. Now the danger of that is that you, and I learned throughout the years to use social media in a more clever way and also take distance from it. Um, there, I attended a lecture on PTSD uh, a couple of months ago and the uh, person who gave the lecture said you have to be aware of the daily violence of diet that we are exposed to. And it's like we have no choice to control the content. You open Facebook or Instagram and you see violent images coming out of Syria. Yes, they are important to look at, but then when do I stop so that I can also uh, protect myself and, and deal with it in a more, you know, um, easier way? And that, that, my approach also made me think of the people's reaction. I mean, these images are important to see, but how can I also, or us as journalists, attract more people to see these important stories without, you know, turning their heads around. Because uh, sometimes you wonder why Kim Kardashian has 60 million followers on Instagram, while other important platforms have far less, uh, fewer followers when there are many important issues that needs to be exposed. Um, so that daily, viol daily diet of violence, um, we as professionals, we need to take a distance from it, learn how to use it, but also come up with more creative ideas of how we can get the audience engage more with it. Mm. Do you trust social media? Do you? Uh... Not completely, it, and that's you know I don't see it as a negative thing. It's coming from again yeah. from uh, you know from where I come from, I was born and raised in Kuwait. In school, it was it's it's and it's still unfortunately in most uh, schools in the Arab world the the old teaching methods where. You don't ask questions. You sit in the classroom, you receive the information, and that's it. You're not involved in the process. While, so I learned throughout the years that, you know, when you're uh, presented with information, you need to ask questions. You need to ask, uh, you know, question the source, um, you know, um, open up discussions with colleagues. So I, do I trust it completely? No, but it's definitely an important source of information with no doubt. There are many interesting independent uh, uh, journalists and activists that I follow on social media that I learn a lot from and they're a source of information for my own work and research. Yeah. You trust them what they show you so they, and it helps you to sort out the things that you feel are fake or not necessarily to, to be trusted. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely. I'm trying to remember examples, but um, it cannot, doesn't come across now. <laughs> okay. Final round of questions. Uh, to, I, I will start on that side and we'll move the microphones up. Um, do you feel that um, now that we see the audience plays a role and there's lots of information out there, journalism is a lot about reporting, do you feel that you as a journalist are also responsible to, to have an impact or to make a real change besides reporting? Uh, yes, and also um, I think uh, it's, I mean, the fact that uh, 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 citizen journalism is here, I think it's more important now, in fact, to us as, as uh, either as the practitioners or, or educators or even the government or even the uh, NGOs to educate uh, uh, you know, citizen journalists, people who, wants to be si who are interested in being citizen journalists. So it's like to educate communities as to how to be able to do uh, their own reporting in a responsible, uh, you know, manners, you know, with the ethics uh, that that we, you know, full-time journalists uh, have to follow, and I think um, it's uh, it's 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 not anymore about uh, 
treating them as our competitors, but as partners, mm -hmm. you know, because... Uh, and together you can make that change. Yeah, I think okay. that's, that's, that's the key. And also uh, to, 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 to also educate the, re the readers, not as some uh, citizen journalists, but as, uh, uh, as how to treat, uh, how, 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 how they uh, treat uh, and process what they read, yeah. you know, that to, to not, uh, I th so I think that the key is education. Uh, so it's very important, uh, and maybe Swanti can add uh, more to that because uh, she is in, in yeah. We're going we're gonna to yeah. disrupt the flow from left to, to right. Uh, is, what, how do you feel? Do you feel that in your education, do f journalists, photo, do they have to be out there to, to make a change? Not necessarily educating the audience to do the same, but do journalists also have a, an obligation to change things for the good or to have a real impact? Um, I think the journalists, uh, I still have a uh, faith and passionate on photojournalism or visual storytelling these days. Though situation is changing, like Nana said, the world has changed. So maybe you have to define the way it's more creative and, and adjusting to the world, to the changing world. And the journalist, I think, has an obligation as a professional, as a person, to change the world in so many ways. It's not necessary that we have to, sp that we are able to stop the war, but we can change, start from our own attitude or our professional level or responsibility in terms of when we're making report tasks, actually. We're following the ethic and we believe that we provide the credible and professional reporters for our readers, for public, and we can contribute the, in a positive way to what's going on in the world. I think pictures has a strong power that can uh, influence the people's perception without any censorship. So as a photojournalist or as an educator, we can think of ourselves which standing point that we will do or we will believe in. Okay. Young, is that f what, same question for you? Does do you feel EPA journalists have also a task to get across what what will be next? You you you, you re, uh, report on a story, but uh, is journalism now also uh, is it also important to to start to get answers and to make changes? I think good journalism is definitely very important and um, it's also a way to, it's okay. Um, yes, good journalism is definitely important um, to change the world if we want, to, if that's what um, we want to do that because uh, especially with images because in a, a lot of times um, images are the first things that people see and the first things that will you know, create um, a line of thought and an action that goes with that thought. And iconic images, um, like the one with um, the Syrian refugee child, Alan Kurdi, uh, lying on the beach, um, that has been shared like um, millions of times within a few hours. And that singular image has galvanized, you know, the whole world to, to action, uh, has actually changed um, a small part, I mean, has actually changed a part of the conversation on uh, to deal with the refugee problem. And other other um, examples I see, uh, like for example, Oman uh, Dagnish with the, the boy in the ambulance, um, that's, that photo has also managed to create um, a lot of conversation and a, a lot of outrage, mm -hmm. basically, uh, to, to, to move, motivate people to, to, do, to change things. And that's why I think uh, photojournalism and good photojournalism is important uh, to, for, for to, to change the world in that sense. But of course, a lot of, um, in this world of um, oversaturated uh, images, uh, plat with the world is oversaturated with images, really. So these um, images, iconic though they may be, are uh, more like the exception than the norm, I would say. So I think um, we definitely have to find new ways uh, to, you know, to, to motivate people to, to create this change, definitely. Nana? Same question for you. Uh, or do you I feel responsible to make a change? Uh, yes, and, and uh, I think, let's use a very simple image quickly. If, if you take the food industry, 
there is healthy food and then there's junk food. We, we all know, you know, if you really want to eat some healthy, you know, if you want to take a girl out and you're serious, you take her to a good restaurant, good food. You are busy, you are at work, junk food. And I think news should be like that. You know, uh, social media is junk food. Can you bring junk food into, can you bring healthy food into the junk food space? You can. And that's what I'm encouraging journalists to do. See how much of the healthy food you can bring into the junk food space. Because whether we like it or not, people are so busy, they don't have time. They will hardly come to the restaurant and sit for a three course, four course, five course meal. So let's try and give them good food. Yeah. And finally, Laura, same question for you. Do you think you're responsible for also to make a change, not just report, but really make a difference? Absolutely. I think, and this is one of the reasons why I do my work. Um, it's, you know, I use photography as a tool to uh, try to reflect my ideas and send out messages that, uh, you know, come from my background, from my surroundings. And definitely, we have an important role. I see it. And it, it is definitely powerful. I believe in it. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Time for some questions uh, from the audience. Yes, there's one, please. Please uh, state your name and, and uh, who do you address the question towards? Okay, uh, okay. Well, my name's Oki. I'm a freelance writer and photographer. Uh, this goes to all the panelists. I, I do agree with Nana that uh, we, we have choices to use images. Um, but the problem is the society still tend to believe for what we see. So uh, I just want to I just want to know your opinions about uh, staging and ethical, and as well as a digital manipulation because sometimes it's done already with the it's also done by the established photographer as well and photojournalists. And how do we know uh, these images? Is it true or is it uh, uh, regarded to hoax and fake news nowadays? That's the first question. And uh, the second question is, um, how, do we, how do we encourage, because the, 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 the media as well, uh, the, the title is Capturing Injustice Through the Lens. On the first day of the World Press Freedom Day, we discussed a lot how images for like a, a Syrian refugee and then the migrant workers, and some of the, some of the NGO a little bit complained about, uh, we tend to spread images that have a negative impact with the society. So how do you encourage the society that we can make more beautiful stories and then I think the world need more beautiful stories. So I kind of agree with Nana that we need more beautiful stories and so that's why I follow your Instagram. So that's the question, thank you. First, first question was about ethics and trustworthy of uh, photography. Can it was, it was addressed to you, right? Okay, you okay. Ask, so, yes, yes. All right, so, so on the question of ethics, um, I feel that we have to maybe even move the conversation to, to something more base. Why, what, what is your motivation? So for example, if you look at the scandal that came out yesterday, you can see he's won PD and this and that and that and that. So you can tell that for this young photographer, what drives him is winning awards. If what really drives you is making impact, is, is touching lives, you know, getting society to move forward, uh, you won't be caught in the ethics problems. You see, um, you know, yes, you, you might do something unethical, like you shoot and you apologize later. You know, we have things we do in the field, you know, where sometimes you know if you ask for permission, they'll say no. So you take the photo and then you apologize. If you are lucky, they won't ask you to delete it, you know, because you really want the story out there. That is also unethical, but when people have to Photoshop and crop and all that, why do they do that? You notice these normally comes up, these issues comes up, when it's, a, it's around entering competitions and winning awards, you know, and so one of the conversations uh, I've been having with Lars is that we have to get into this space where when people apply for awards and they get selected, they should be interviewed and in the interview, you were asked, so the person you photographed, what happened to them? Where are they now? Do you have their phone number? Can we call them? Is this what happened? You know, when people know that, there'll be a follow-up from the, from the award-giving agencies. I think they'll be more responsible. But I really hope that a lot more people will come into 
journalism and photography because they really want to touch lives, not to make a name for themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, you said also the question was about uh, spreading photos with a negative impact. Why don't we shoot more positive? Do you have somebody that you want to address this question to? Uh, I think it's better for all the panelists because, uh, yeah, I mean, because it goes to media also. And it's also part of the role of photo editor. I mean, if the photographer send the photos, uh, I mean, photo editor also has a role which, which images uh, he or she wants to put in, in the newspaper as well. So may I may I answer that? Yeah. Can I can I answer? You that? can answer. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll f um, I can understand the point of view of NGOs like not wanting to spread negative, but I'm just going to take one specific case. War is though any war is ugly, and certain images need to be at least documented because they're going to be used in the future as evidence that you know this is what happened and you know ugly images sometimes can shift the public opinion and this is i believe one of the main reasons why the american army when they allow photographers to be embedded with them they control the content they control what is being sent out there because if the American audience see the reality of the war and what happens when the soldiers are in the field, this is definitely going to change the public opinion. But what we see from war images is a woman lying on the grave crying for her lost husband who was fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq. And this is a romantic image, it romanticizes war, and you would get a different reaction. So tough, ugly images coming out of Syria, for example, yeah, they're important to be seen. Now, I worked as a photo editor for the French news agency, and some American clients complained to the headquarters that they would withdraw their subscriptions because there are a lot of harsh and tough images coming out. but. The, you know, the, the, the people in charge refuse to follow the request and say, listen, we have to send the content and it's up to you to choose what photos you want to publish to your readers. So yes, some images are ugly, but they need to be out there. And, and this is what happened with the Bosnian war. Uh, you know, the, the, the world ignored what was happening, but there were journalists documenting uh, the event that later on when some politicians use the excuse uh, you know uh, we didn't know no you did know because there were journalists doing their job and documenting what was happening okay. thank you Laura uh, um, you want to respond to this yes yeah. one yes go ahead okay I'm I'm just really really want to add uh, the question um, the first question is uh, about the uh, ethic and distrust. I think it's not completely or hundred percent is is the photojournalist or media sector task to keep the ethic, but it's also part the other way uh, the other hand I think it's also important to look at the public or the viewers, I think. So I'm referring to the situation in Jakarta or in Indonesia on social media these days when a young artist Jakarta based make a manipulative photograph with Photoshop so he's like like making photos from the two figures political figures shaking hand and creating the debate or the thought provoking but then how 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 do we as a professional photographers react or, or standing point of view towards this phenomenon? It's very controversial on, on social media, on Facebook, but then it's also get a positive response from media across the world as if like a legitimate to make that kind of stuff. So I think it's important that how also look at the, or to position ourselves as a public, as a readers, among other works. Okay. I think we're uh, out of time. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for sharing your ideas, your thoughts, and your insights. And uh, we are here so we can answer many more questions. And uh, so 
Thank you very much that I was uh, uh, able to host this and uh, uh, have a nice day. Thank you. One photo. <laughs> Together? Okay. Guys, listen to the photographer. We need to be. Uh, oh, okay. Where do you want? Is he in front of the table? Yeah.